Okay, great. So welcome everyone to another episode of Smart Investing by the Financial Fox with Zach Mir and Clem Chambers. So Zach, you are uh, the first one to join. And uh, I mean, I think there is a bit of pressure in the market, isn't it? After the CPI number came out last week, everybody rushed to buy Bitcoin and gold. And then, uh, and then you know, then things are getting a little bit more stress. So uh, the market, they are not looking very green, let's say. It's more, I look at the screen and it's like red. Yeah, I think there's a couple of points at the moment. One is that um, a lot of people in the market that I'm speaking to are, are thinking or realize that uh, the crypto area has been, seems to be sucking out the liquidity from the stock market, which is not helping. Obviously, you've got all this uh, inflation scaremongering, which I think uh, is also, um, it's a problem, not because of necessarily because of inflation, but also because, but also because uh, a lot of people are, are not old enough to remember what inflation look like, looks like and what it actually does. Uh, the old thing in the 20th century was that when the when the inflation came, normally because of a boom, they, the government would raise interest rates and, um, and basically ruin everything. Uh, so you had a boom and bust due to raising interest rates. And the fact we haven't had a bust uh, for 20 years, let's say, is because that what I thought was idiotic approach of, um, of, of raising interest rates or controlling infl- or trying to control inflation like that was actually um, not a good idea. You, you tend to destroy good companies and um, good businesses uh, by raising interest rates. And that actually just is, 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 is a very blunt instrument. So I'm hoping that this on this occasion, they won't actually raise interest rates by a, a significant amount. It's probably better actually, if you're gonna do anything to actually raise taxes on like you know like a vat type thing on on spending rather than actually on um, you know making house you know root causing a house price collapse or, or that kind of thing okay so so do you think is something just a transitory or the stock market is going to be a bit um yeah, uh, ectic. I don't know how to say. It's not. It's not, think, good think, to, it's not a good time to just put. Uh, you know, just uh, invest in the stock market because you don't know what's happened tomorrow. There might be a, a bigger correction. Yeah, but the stock market is all about. For many people, unless you're trading like day to day or a day trader, the stock market is really about dividends, and dividends are now as high or higher than they were before the pandemic. So really, if you want yield, um, you go for you know you go for the boring you know Unilevers or the Avivas or whatever else uh, Clem uh, likes um, the, the slow stuff, and that's how you get your return. The stock market, I think, is still offering um, you know great great dividend situations, great yields, and I think with inflation, actually, um, companies will be able to profiteer and raise their prices and actually pay more dividends to shareholders. So if you're, in a way, if you're worried about inflation, I think um, buying dividend stocks is, is, is probably the way forward. Um, okay. I, have to say, I have to say though that um, as somebody, you know, I've, I've been doing charting technical analysis for 30 years, um, almost since I think since you were born. And basically it's, it is incredible now that you can day trade a crypto and all you need to know are a few charting techniques. You don't even need to know what the crypto does. You just sit there with a five-minute chart or a one-hour chart or a daily chart. And these cryptos move day and night. And you can double your money or halve your money or lose all your money. But you have that movement, which you're not getting in the stock market uh, generally. Um, I think that the cryptos are a bit like um, uh, the sort of text, the, the tech stocks were, you know, American tech stocks. Um, and so they're basically, the coins are basically like um, buying a, a new Apple or a new Facebook or, or, or that sort of thing. And they had that volatility that um, the tech stocks had, especially the dot-com time. So um, I think, you know, technical trading, this is the time for technical trading, if you can do it, if you know how to do it. 
Okay. Um, I mean, another element that is quite important is uh, to be able to pick the right stock because uh, we are getting to the point where the stock market, uh, um, as you said, you know, is not like it was earlier on in the year. So you need to make sure that you invest in the right company. You talk to a lot of CEOs every day. You see lots of projects. Um, the UK market is obviously undervalued. And we mention a few stock always every week. So what will be the stocks that you want to maybe highlight this week? I think the uh, thing I was discussing with some traders uh, even today is that uh, uh, this, the, the flow of new stocks to the market is actually continuing. And in a way, um, because of the caution that um, uh, brokers have and um, you know CEOs have, uh, the good thing at the moment, I think, is because of that weakness in sentiment in the stock market, they're pricing IPOs uh, relatively cheaply. And in fact, you know, if you go around just buying at the moment in London anyway, resources stocks, uh, resource IPOs, you can do very well. I think this, you know, you can't. I can't think of any small cap resources play um, that's actually not um, succeeded for for traders in the recent past. You had Caracal gold which was a, i think came out at a penny and went up to 1.8 it's about 1.3 now ben's creek was famously uh, from 10p up to <coughs> 30p in a few weeks so that and uh, the, the low pricing and the caution is actually working in favor of people um, investing in ipos and maybe that's the area to look at okay okay let's uh, let's talk about that because it's quite interesting um is there a good time to invest in IPOs? Because, uh, um, you know, obviously we, we saw that the London Stock Exchange put a bit of um, pressure on uh, the standard listing. So now it looks like you have to have a, a bigger cap market capitalization, like 50 million. So Aquis, perhaps for a smaller company, will be more attractive, will be the place to be. Uh, what I'm seeing is like there are not many tech and particularly tech with crypto element, they are actually getting appreciated on the London market. Is that right to say? Um, or do you have a different view? I think the um, on Aquas, the, there were two there were two stocks which were uh, which are in that space. Well, these two two met two ones, two of them which have performed very well. One is Valerian blockchain which is basically, I could call it financial NFTs, that's the area it's going to go into. And then you've got KR1, which is a digital um, asset investor. And both of those have, well, KR1 was, you know, I think it was like just a few pence even at the beginning of the year. It's now pound fifty, something like that. So <laughs> I think there are, there are the situations um, which, which are good. There's two combinations. There's either a company which is, you know, making money hand over fist, which I think KR1 has been doing. A brilliant um, uh, team there of investors uh, at that company. And for me, it, I think it's probably in that space on the London market, Argo blockchain, obviously the crypto miner. But I think in some ways, um, uh, KR1 um, has actually done um, even better and maybe, you know, may, maybe more reliable uh, for people, or more people feel more secure with that. Just okay, I'm, I'm putting probably, up the yeah. I'm yeah, putting exactly. up the they, <laughs> they, they actually invest in, so they are an investment company in... They're actually, yeah, they're actually, they're investing in all the uh, little coins and stuff like that. So they've done brilliantly. And I think that it's, you know, if you're not a crypto day trader, uh, I think KR1 is the company to uh, to look at. And you can see, you know, that, that, that finally after a few years, the penny sort of dropped in terms of, uh, what they do and it's a you know it's a much appreciated company so that is a is a runaway act for me that's the best best and most you know, solid new economy play on uh, aquis um valerium <coughs> is second blr m that's the um uh, the uh financial nfts and um they're still you know they're still sort of moving along the line there but you can see that uh, 
that's been a, an incredible uh, success this year. Okay, announced- fact, can I can I stop stop you here because I'm not familiar with this company and obviously the NFT space has been hit by lots of hype and uh, um, from uh, from my crypto experience i i think that it's very important that nfts company they start to develop a very strong use case otherwise they are not going to hold the volatility of the market because no, but the same no but the simple thing here is that they would turn uh, they would turn financial instruments and stocks into nfts and so therefore if you like tesla rather than paying a thousand dollars a share you could buy um a one dollar nft in tesla um, and get if there was a dividend, you get the dividend. It would be an exact replica okay. of, of so, the stock. So where about do you trade it? Do do they ever? Well, they've just bought. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. This yeah, they well no. They, 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 what I thought was a masterstroke was I think earlier uh, this month or last month when they bought eighty percent of the Gibraltar uh, stock exchange, and yeah. so they will have that platform to do that. So it would be the first, you know, the world's first NFT, you know, financial NFT. Um, uh, stock exchange. Gibraltar is a very friendly jurisdiction towards um, the, um, the the crypto space, as you know from well, maybe Coincilium, if you follow that on the yeah, Aquas yeah, market as well. Also, online blockchain now. They exactly. Have so, so buying so buying eighty percent of the, the Gibraltar stock exchange, I think that was probably worth um, uh, more of a spike. Than the original spike you had in the shares up Find a bold P. move, uh, I would say. Yeah, it was a no, I thought it was a, it was a, it was a great move, um, and you know they they could do that because you know the share price has gone up, and they I, I just thought that was one of the cleverer uh, moves and understandable moves that I've seen um, on the market this year. So I think those two companies are you know particularly. Um, you know they're being clever about it, and well, they, you know it's a, they're clever companies. And that, at the end of the day, if you you know you speak to the CEOs and you you know you follow the the story and you see yeah uh, yeah they know what they're doing. And the same with you know it was the same with um, with KR1. You can see that you know that the crypto you know, Bitcoin halved and it went all over the place during this year. But the performance of um, KR1 actually um, because it's so diversified within digital assets has actually been relatively smooth so that's you know that's a, a nice thing to, uh, to 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 go for but i think the the, uh, the 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 issue in the market in the london market these days is that the only thing that people seem to well people just seem to like either companies making money hand over fist which is obviously difficult to find but they they really it's sort of 80 percent blue sky and 20 percent reality that's a sort of it's like that diet uh, the, you know 80 20 diet or one of those type of things that uh, um, you 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 kind of need um, a lot of blue sky, which is why I like you know the the quantum blockchain um, uh, company QBT, because again you've got something where people are looking forward to um, the company developing. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, quantum okay. you know, computing. So, so Zach, sorry, and after this spike, <laughs> you have been following the company well. I remember we took when. Uh, um, Look I'm not that. sure it was it was <laughs> here exactly. So tell me the latest development. A few people I hear have been talking about this company. So yeah, so so this one they I think they the the before this the, the, the shares spiked um, when they said they were um, applying for a patent. I'm not a I'm not a rocket scientist in this area, but basically we're waiting for news on the company's development of. Um, their quantum computing IP, let's say, and uh, as you can see, the market has uh, very high hopes that, uh, with that. Um, obviously, in terms of quantum quantum computing as applied to uh, mining Bitcoin or uh, any other application, um, it would be transformational. So that's what people are excited about. Uh, why they're excited about um, that particular situation. So those. Those, um, I think, th- those are probably the three uh, favorite ones and understanding, uh, understanding ones um, or understandable ones um, at the moment. There are uh, there is there are some other companies. The uh, Quantum Exponential, uh, newly listed on uh, Aquis, uh, that's looking to buy assets in the quantum uh, computing area, and so um, that is probably that's a, I interviewed them uh, just when they floated. And I thought that was interesting. They've got a very, uh, a very um, high-powered 
management and advisory team there is uh, Roger Sargent, who's well known as a small cap um, investor, and uh, as I think was in the paper the other week as well. So I think that one um, looks uh, looks like an interesting um, situation too. So, you know, okay. the, that, that's the sort of cutting edge of um, of, uh, of of these this type of area. Um, so let's go back to Argo blockchain and then we mention OBC. So we are basically covering all the crypto company. I think that would be yeah. just good. To, so, right. So uh, let's go back three years. They obviously made uh, like an impressive, uh, um, you know, start. Um, then we saw the. Well, no, I think the, 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 what's, I mean, it's the same with probably with, with this and, and with the KR1, because both of them were going well before the, 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 the Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, it went through 50,000, 60,000. It's amazing how the London market thinks. I mean, it is amazing that uh, it, it um, takes a long time to, uh, uh, to get the message. So you can have, I mean, this is it. This ball can have players down for you know weeks, months, you know years uh, longer than they should. Whereas in America, I'm sure you know just with just a whisper of something and that yeah. and they go up. So uh, we have a yeah, very Zach, uh, Zach, sluggish I'm gonna market. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you here. I think the main issue what I'm seeing is that actually. Um, a retail stockbroker, they don't understand anything. They don't see the value in um, uh, crypto or blockchain uh, tech businesses. And that's a big problem because uh, the way the, ma the land market is uh, structured is like if you have to go for a fundraise and you need a retail, you go to a stockbroker, you pitch your, uh, you know, your business and obviously you partner with them to go out and uh, promote your story and, and get the, the, you know, the high network and the, and the professional investor on board, whatever it is for an IPO or a fundraise. But it looks like um, we are stuck in the, the middle area where in London you have got lots of talent, you have got some VC, you have got some great crypto investors. They build obviously um, wealth and they build knowledge investing in the blockchain space. But when it comes to stockbrokers, to retail brokers, um, there is a hurdle there because you don't find really lots of stockbrokers, they understand the market. Or the crypto opportunity. Well, I think the um, that the reason that the reason that's the case is because most stockbrokers these days, you know, don't give advice, and it's not really, it's not really an advisory uh, type of market anymore. It's it's up to individual investors to do the research um, themselves, and obviously, uh, that's not an easy uh, thing to do. It's very time consuming and everything else. So I think that, but it's it's just in general, London is very slow to get on the bandwagon of new things it doesn't like tech stocks anyway it doesn't understand them and it's one of the reason why it's the main reason why london, the london markets um underperform because we just don't have that uh, that uh, amount the right amount of tech stocks and we don't you know we don't value them we don't tend to value them at all so and even argo blockchain you know it's listed over here but you know it's really trying to be it might as well just go to the us yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so the last company that we are going to mention is OBC, um, which, uh, um, yeah, Clem is not here, so we can talk about it. And, well, it's been going on for ages because it's really a tech company, uh, but uh, they got into blockchain um, 2018. Oh, great. That's Clem is here. And the main project is uh, Umbria Network, which is a DeFi um, company building apps and products for um, decentralized finance. And the cross chain bridge is really being very successful. We are announced like every every week, we are announcing a partnership. So, I have like. to log off now, aren't I? You're going to breach all my social media policies. <laughs> no, Clem, we were just said that let's talk about OBC, why Clem is not here, because we talk about all the, um, all the uh, crypto company and we were making observation about is the land of market really understanding crypto or maybe is better than the US. I'm sure that you have a view on that. But just to finish off on OBC, um, 
I mean, the, the Umbria project and the, the Nani Bridge is getting lots of traction and it's building a really uh, a big NFT ecosystem. So definitely is the project that anybody interested in crypto should have a look uh, because OBC hasn't been... Um, I'm gonna say going out, spending lots of money in marketing. And that's why maybe you don't have the visibility that other uh, project or other company have, but you know, there is a lot of value there. It's hard, it's hard, it's, Steph, it's hard for me to say anything yeah. um, about it, but I will say that a lot of people have a need for bridging between chains. And we fulfill that need and we fulfill it at a significantly lower cost to the alternatives and we do it at a significantly faster speed so that they get their stuff bridged significantly faster than other people because we've got some pretty um, exciting uh, and funky technology, which no one else has, which yeah. is kind of cool and groovy and all that. And that's in, in the, um, that's out there in the public domain. So I can say that. And because of that, people are using it. And again, you can see that you can see it being used um, if you want to go look for it um, in the right way. And it is fulfilling a need and therefore it's marketing itself. Yeah. And that's why it's growing. Yeah, I'm just going to put up. Uh, um, just So this is the, the interesting part of it, something that we're doing, which is pretty unique. Now, if you go to other people's bridges and a lot of people doing bridges and they go come to our bridge and, you know, pay, pay some money and bridge your stuff over. Now, what we do is we say, add liquidity to the pools of, say, Ethereum on Ethereum or Ethereum on Matic. And when people transfer from one chain to the next, you will get fees for your liquidity. Because what you're effectively doing is acting in, in a very abstract way, like a bank. So back in the old days, say the County Monte Cristo, if you know that story, he has a fabulous fortune and he finds it and he brings it back. And he then goes home to his hometown under a pseudonym and is this rich Count of Monte Cristo. But actually he's not carrying his gold with it. He's carrying letter of credits. And effectively he shows up at the bank and says, here's my letter of credit from the bank in wherever it is in Italy and give me a bag of gold. And we are operating on the same basis as the old banking, medieval banking system used to work. And yes. you know, that is um, a powerful dynamic and that enables members of the public to um, put liquidity on of that they have on chains um, and make money from people wanting to move that token from one chain to the next. And that's something that no one else is doing. And that is a very powerful dynamic which we've come up with, which is um, doing very, very well for Nani and, and its growth. Yeah, yeah. And then uh, the Umbria as a token as well. Also, anybody can, can check it out here on ADVFN and then you can see um, the chart so well if anyway, you look at that chart it's quite interesting because yeah. you can see it's got that initial jump that it had when we released it um back at the beginning of the year uh, that a lot of crypto has and then you can see the dump that happened when bitcoin crashed and it hit 50 cents which was its initial um, price on uniswap and it's still on uniswap and you can buy it on uniswap um and just go there and get it and you know it's tripled since then and it's tripled because People who are using uh, the Nani Bridge in particular go, wow, this is great. And if, if you look at the competition, all their projects are valued at two or three hundred million dollars. And our projects are worth about 15 million at the moment. So I think that's a good indication of, of upside if you care to see it that way. But what, yeah, but why is the London market so crap at valuing tech exactly let's 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 see what well Glenn because they're they, they, it's what's wrong I mean, I said, what's wrong what, what's wrong with them i, 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 I can sense. help you there it doesn't make, it, it doesn't make any i'll just i'll just finish the i mean like finish the question it doesn't make any sense given that tech is literally non-geographical so there should be no difference between the rating of the of a of, you know a, a chip here or a chip in the u.s it doesn't make any sense if it's a, you know, a resource or if it's a service or something like that, you could say, uh, you know, like lawyers in London get, should get paid half what they get paid in New York or whatever. But this is just idiotic. Would you like to know the answer? Yes, no, yes. The city of London is populated with thick people that did arts at university, darling. And they know all about philosophy and psychology <laughs> and archaeology, but they know bugger all about science. 
and therefore they hate it. They went and did soft um, courses at university, you know, uh, ancient Greek, you know, the, the good old um, trifecta of, of, of classics and all that good stuff. And they've all come out of, of Cambridge and Oxford with arts degrees and they're not scientists. So of course they, they love good story, but you know, technology, that's, that's frightening to them. That's exactly what they hate the most. If they so were, what, they'd love science, what? they would have gone and done mathematics at Oxford, <laughs> or they would have gone and done chemistry or physics or any, any of those things that are changing the world. No, instead they studied Kierkegaard. Yeah, mm. and a, a load of philosophy from 200 years ago, that's about as obsolete as, as a dead thing. And, and then they come into the city of London because they're all, all out of those universities, old boy. And then they go and they take the summer off, old chap, and go to Wimbledon, et cetera. You know the sort. <laughs> of course they don't like technology. <laughs> I want to go back to that country homes and, no, and have the, strawberries it, and cream. Yeah but, yeah, but isn't it the case that if you had an American, let's say American text back, or what, what they should be doing is just buying all the UK tech and then selling it on in the US? They want to go to Wimbledon. They want to, well, they want to paint the pergola. They want to go back to their, their, their grandpa's mansion in the, in the country. They want to, they want, they're, 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 not, they're not in that zone. They're public school boys with silver spoons in their mouths. Technology, that's for the developing countries, you know. That's for the oiks. You must have met a million of these people. Yeah, yeah, some of them very, very close to home. So, yeah, uh, yeah. A, but, a million uh, of these people. And you know what? You know, if you look at a certain farm manager who went belly up last year, yeah, and he was talking about how clever they were until they went horribly bust and lost people hundreds of millions. He had a suntan that looked like he'd spent the whole year in the desert because he sat in his garden the whole year. And then his fund went belly up. Funny that. Yeah. I mean, that's the attitude of the UK. You know, the city of London doesn't want to open at eight o'clock anymore. Oh, we want to get our work life um, balance properly done. But, so, yeah, but is there any opportunity in that, in, with, with that le le um, lethargy and that uh, ignorance, is there any opportunity for an investor? It's, it, well, Long-term investors, for sure, right? Because everything, so much is badly valued. Well, it, in extremis, if you want to go there, you just buy companies that are going to get taken out by American companies because it's bargaining basement oh, Britain. I mean, why is, an, why is an arm on the London Stock Exchange anymore? Because it got snapped up for bugger all. The, the most powerful chip manufacturer, the smartest chip manufacturer, powering the iPhone and every single blooming mobile phone in, on planet Earth. And some Japanese company comes along and snaps it up for, for a chump change. And then everyone goes, oh, no, oh, no, don't do that. Oh, don't buy our technology. It's the only thing we've got left. You know, it, it, it's pathetic. And do you know what? You can't blame the troops. You blame the, the, the officers. And they're all public school boys who studied arts. You Clem, know? What, what and you wonder why we're not a scientific country anymore. What, what about... Uh perhaps uh, listing on the, on the US market and keep a, li a listing on the UK market, there might be a way or something that perhaps company in the UK could look at. Would that help to drive more interest from uh, uh, international investors? If you look at the way that the world works, people aren't very good at running listings outside of the country they're in because they don't understand the dynamics of the markets um, that operate in those countries. I mean, when American companies come and list on the A market, you know, poor people, what, what were they thinking, right? Yeah. And so it's very hard. It's the same with corporations. They find it very difficult to be international. When you think how, you know, absolutely competition crushing someone like Google is, yeah? Well, where are they? Any, anywhere outside English-speaking countries? Nowhere, right? Because once you have that language barrier, all the magic just goes away. And it's the same with distance, right? If, if you try to do a, a deal with an American company, don't try to do it in your country. You'll get nothing. You have to go to the headquarters in wherever it is, you know, Ohio or in Silicon Valley and talk to them there. Then you can get stuff done. The moment you go away from the tree, you don't, the fruit isn't there. The fruit falls by the tree. And that is a problem with trying to solve um, business problems by shifting geography. You, you just end up, you know, in, in, a, in a vacuum. You know, listing on the London on the New York Stock Exchange, yeah, you're going to get a 10 times multiple for some businesses. But you're also going to find it very, 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 very difficult. And if you look at the ADRs on the American market, 
a, a Vodafone, for example, won't be valued like a Verizon as an ADR in the American market. So, the, the, you know, once you once you get away from your culture, it's very, very difficult to, um, you know, achieve. So what you gain in, in leverage from a great market, you lose in, in the fact that you don't understand the cultural ways of things there. Yeah, that's a point. That's a really big point. Okay. I mean, you can't just move, right? You can't just up sticks and go. And, and some companies have done that and done it extremely well by doing that. But you absolutely have to up sticks and go. You cannot stay. Um, you know, you, you, you can't expect to be an a incredibly successful company in one country and be um, you know, in, incredibly um, successful stock listed in another. I, I don't know anyone that's done that. I do know people that have actually shifted the whole, gone, oh, forget it. I'm not going to be in the UK. I'm off. And people do that all the time, right? Silicon Valley is full of a rich English people that went, what am I doing in the UK? You've got to be crazy. I'm going. And leave, you know, brain drain is a major thing in lots of different cultures, including the UK. Okay, right. I want to bring us something else because I'm here in Malta for the blockchain conference and is actually is gaming and blockchain. So there are over 10,000 people. It's really a big event. And the feeling is that Gaming is getting more and more into crypto. Um, or are you talking about gambling game. or are you talking about playing is, games? Is gaming and gambling is there is there is everything is coming to the crypto space. And it's the first time that happen to see something like that because they've always been divided. So there are esports, there is gambling, and everybody's talking about gamify. So NFT defining games. Um, what are what I wanted maybe to discuss is, uh, is there any stocks they are doing that, that perhaps uh, maybe Zach know uh, that we can maybe bring to the conversation and, and claim, do you think uh, this is going to get bigger, this uh, gamify area, um, including metaverse, including crypto, including... Okay. Let, let, me, let me just um, run through this for the next six hours. Um, don't confuse gambling with computer games. Yeah, A, that's a really bad thing to do because computer games will then get lumped in with all those very um, interesting people that are in gambling, i.e. large quantities of organised crime. Let's not put too much of a finer point on it. Yeah, gamification is just one of those buzzwords which is just rubbish um, because you can't take a word processor and gamify it. And that's the implication is that, oh, you can take a really boring, stupid thing and make it interesting by making it a game. That's 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 total rubbish. Yeah. So gamification of non games. That's just nonsense. Clem, what about I'm stopping you here because a lot of fashion brands, for example, or many brands are going into games. Garbage. To be cool. garbage. Garbage. OK, great. That's that's a good point to highlight. People want to want to walk down the street looking great with a fantastic coat or a nice handbag. They don't yeah. want to sit there. I, I like that because we have seen Louis Vuitton, we have seen Burberry, they're all doing stuff in Roblox or a different kind of thing, but this is rubbish. I, I agree with you. It's just, not- it's, just, it's just they're doing what they're doing, which is, which is doing something new and funky, not because they believe in it, but because it attracts attention. Attention-seeking behaviour is what exactly the fashion industry is, beginning, middle and end attention seeking that's what fashion does for you gets you attention oh look at that yeah. person with that snappy jacket so it's only natural for them to do attention seeking behavior by following the latest trend for 10 minutes before they go do something else i mean I, I was going to london i was on the eurostar many years ago and we were going into paris for the paris fashion show i wasn't going there for that reason and it was full of models and as they pulled into the station about to pull into the station they all jumped up and all ran for the toilet because they all wanted to change into into fashionable stuff and I sat back and I said, I've heard about snakes on a plane, but this is flakes on a train. OK, I think that that's a brilliant comment. Zaki? What's that? All right, I'm just, I'm just going to leave you with one stock for the week. OK, go on. So it's called um, Tiro Party Graphite. So it makes oh, it so we, uh, gra- we, we are back to mining. Yeah, yeah, well, but just finishing off, that's just the one I think I feel I feel upset that the shares have come down from one pound sixty uh, down to they were like um, 69p or 66p at the beginning of the week. I think they're 79 now. 
Um, and I just think that um, it's probably gone too far. It's down to 50, 60% of the high. What is the ticker? The company very well. TGR. TGR. <laughs> Sorry, TGR. Okay. Well, graphics are thing. So that Graphene, I, I agree. That, um, I think that. So you can see that it came down from like one pound fifty, one pound sixty. Um, it had a, it was actually a very successful IPO, which underlines the point I was saying. Um, it was floated at forty five p, went up to um, it went at one fifty, one sixty, and I think that. Um, I think that given what they've done over the last year, nearly or 11 months, uh, the shares shouldn't be as low as they are. The thing I like about this company is that they've uh, they announced um, earlier in the summer that they've got this uh, new um, graphene um, aluminium composite, which has 97% the conductivity of copper. And uh, if you know how what the situation is with copper at the moment, you'll know that um, basically there's not enough of it and we need tons of it for electric cars and stuff like that and so i think that this company just with that graphene aluminium composite alone um could be a a world beater down the line um so you have you know I mean, obviously make it, as aluminium is lighter than uh, copper you would have a situation also that you would have like evs and you know in planes and other other uses like that where you use copper this composite could really be transformational and um they use they use aluminium in in Christmas tree lights rather than copper because it's cheaper. Yeah, so that's yes, exactly. So, but this this would have with the with the graphene composite that mix in there. You're 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 cutting out, Zach. I think the satellite's going behind the um, cloud. Is near to what well both next time. Okay, I think we miss uh, we miss you. Zach. Yeah, if if I can just add a little bit to that, if you look at that trend, it's a pretty straight trend. So you know, it might be something that you wait for it to break out of that straight line down. If that was something that interested you, because you know the trend is your friend, but not if you want to go long when the trend is down. Yes, so yes. you might want to, you, anybody who was thinking about buying that might want to wait for it to um, get out of that. Having said that, it just jumped 4p. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as, as the moment Zach spoke, so, you know. Okay, so but, uh, Clem, I think, I think it was uh, very interesting, the point that you raised about uh, don't mix between gambling and gaming, because that's what uh, is happening. Um, you see... Gaming, gaming, right? Company, um, they are put together sometimes in event or in discourse by people they don't understand the space very well. We gambling company because it's all about you know online gaming, gambling, and that's a very big bad mistakes to do. There's been a very, very vicious and very evil wave in computer games over the last five or six years which has been trying to make games as, as viciously um, money generating as gambling games. So you have um, things like um, Farmville um, trying to, you know, take 20 bucks an hour out of players and, and actually being built using psychological war techniques, actually um, brainwashing techniques to try to addict players into repetitive obsessive behavior at great cost. And that they design these games to have no limit on how much money you can spend, have no limit on how much um, money you can you can waste. I mean, tens of thousands of dollars, these games are to designed to take out people that are vulnerable. And which is, to me, the kind of heart of darkness. Uh, and, and that's been a sort of, you know, evil push in the computer game industry, particularly on mobile, towards the depravity of the casino and um and i say depravity because it is because you know a lot of people wreck their lives and if you go in america for example and you look at all the fraud cases white collar fraud 
a, a huge number of those white collar fraudsters are basically addicted gamblers. So they steal money to go to Vegas to to um, lose it at the tables. So it's a very, very it, it's it's a social ill gambling um, or can be. You can have responsible gambling and people try hard to do that and all that stuff, but doesn't take gambling companies long to leave that path and get into the into the realm of trying to rip people's face off when they go in to try to do a little bit of gambling. You only have to see these uh, high stake fruit machines and what they do and how they do it to see the the dark path that um, gaming, uh, i.e. gambling, takes pretty quickly. And you only have to understand operant conditioning, operant conditioning. Anybody who wants to look that up on Wiki will see it. Uh, which is these techniques, which are basically animal training techniques, they put them into these gambling games or these games that are not gambling because you can't win, but you can spend huge amounts of money. These brainwashing, operant conditioning um, techniques, they put them in these games to, to, to hurt you. I mean, it's about parting you with your money for very little. That's, that's hurting you. Yeah. So I think, you know, that whole side of things needs to be seen for what it is, which is a very toxic, very evil, very nasty side to things, which, of course, casinos have always lived in that space. And any, any companies in the computer games business that head towards that, you know, better, better hope there's no afterlife because they're going to burn in hell. It's, you know, it's a really horrible side to things. And people tempted to think that's an exciting thing because there's money in it. I mean, there's money in bank robbery and drug dealing too. And this stuff is just as bad, apart from it's legal. Yeah. So there's computer games and, and the economics pay, pay to play, which is the opposite. It's the game giving money to people. And then there's games that take money from people, but not just a reasonable amount, not just the $7 an hour that cinema does, not just the 10 cents an hour that a computer game might do, but 10 bucks, 100 bucks an hour in an environment which tries to suck you in and keep you there until you are a, a dried out husk. And that part of, of um, these developments is very dark indeed, and people should see it for what it is, which is very evil. Yeah, I think, that, yeah, exactly. And that is also creating uh, um, toxicity around uh, some uh, interesting and some good uh, crypto and blockchain projects. Oh, it tracks the wrong element, right? I mean, yeah, where there are resources, there are predators. That's the law of the jungle. And you see that very clearly in crypto. There's a lot of resources here and there's a lot of predators. Okay. And you have to be very, very careful because you can't make good money with bad people. Okay. Yeah. And you can't, you know, the predators, you just don't want to mix with them because, you know, you are the prey. Claim and that's one of the dark sides of crypto as a whole and also crypto plus gambling, you can see that's not going to end well, is it? Okay, exactly. Do you want to maybe to shell your three or four or two, if you have, uh, favorite uh, play-to-earn project? Well, I mean, I, I, when I look out there um, at what exists, they are um, very, um, well, very, very early stage. So I, I think it's just the beginning of, of a whole um, environment. I mean, uh, the, 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 it's, it's the beginning of something very, very big, but it, it's like at the stage of um, the Atari 800 or Pong, it is just the beginning. I mean, yeah, I mean, you're pulling this up and say Axie Infinity, Decentraland. I mean, you know, I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not gonna, they're great. I mean. Blimey, they're worth um, billions to central land is. But when you think about their value and how early stage the whole thing is, it's, it's I prefer to step back and, and not say, oh, I, I, you know, I've, I've, I've looked and I've played at any of these and they're amazing, they're amazing. I might have some, you know, quite a lot of Avogotchi. Uh, but it's just an indication of just how massive this whole sector is going to be because these things are really version one. In fact, 0 0.1 of what is going to happen here. And the pay to play dynamic, I think is gonna be massive. And gamers actually getting paid to play, getting paid for their attention um, in significant sums. I think that's very good. 
Clem, is the same as providing liquidity. It's the same concept. You provide the liquidity, you get paid. So is your... Yeah, uh, in a way, you can certainly look at it like that because liquidity and attention are not totally fungible, but they are analogs. So your attention is worth money. Exactly. So some, something else that we have been uh, talking, I think the other day was about creating content. And I think that's for many people, many podcasters, many journalists, anybody that is creating good content, that perhaps could be, um, could be also a big market because as you create company, content, you get paid. Well, once upon a time in a galaxy far away, when I started out in, in all this stuff back when I was a kid, people used to say content is king. And I believed that for about 10 minutes until I started creating content and found out that no content isn't, is, is maybe at best queen. Yeah. The, it's the distribution that, that gets the money. The distribution of the content is where the power is. And if you're a rock and roll band and you're not getting ripped off by a record company or you're a, a, an author who's getting 15% of the value of the book for writing it and creating it, you, you soon know, that you are far down the value chain, even though you're cre- you're like a chicken. You lay the egg, and what do they do? They take the egg and they eat it. And in the moment you stop laying them more eggs, they eat you. Yeah. And that is the content developer's dynamic in the old world, where distribution, and 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 sometimes even more than retail, control the value chain and extract all the value out of the content provider's content. Now the internet broke that open an amount and then in steps google and they take all the money G- google take 50 billion dollars worth of profit mind you not 180 billion which is what their sales are out of your attention we've got the attention and they intercept 180 billion dollars of value and you don't get any of it apart from a search engine okay so there's an example of an intermediating force when you play a computer game and you win the sort of extreme pain after playing for a week it's not worth anything because you can't sell it well, it's very difficult to sell and you might get thrown out of the game if you try or if you, even if you manage to. So up to now, the value of your um, attention and play is valueless. You pay, you get the experience, you don't get anything else. With a pay to play, your attention, you are the content and you get paid because you are the content. You go in and play the game. And if you play it badly or, or you don't kill many bunnies and don't find many magic swords, you don't make much money, but if you're good at the game and, and you can earn a lot of money because you do win the sort of extreme pain and somebody wants to buy that off you because he doesn't want to play for 20 hours to slay that dragon with the sword that he needs. So he comes to you and you go off and, and you buy it and sell it as an NFT and he comes in with the sword of extreme pain and he cuts out 20, hour, 20 hours of his tension and he's paid to not be the content for 20 hours. Yeah. And that, again, crypto does this thing is it inverts the pyramid of power. So money flow, flows to the many from the few rather from the from the uh, flows from the few to the many rather from the many to the few. Yeah. Money f- flows uphill in the old system and the poop flows down. As we all know, we live in that world. Crypto turns it upside down. So the poo goes to the goes to the powerful and the resources go to the many. And that is the true underlying revolutionary dynamic of crypto. And if the people in power work that one out, they really will try to stamp it out quick. Yeah, that comes back to all the um, argument about regulation and uh, and uh, also the future of banks. Uh, but let's uh, let's maybe not get into that. Let's go back to the financial market, which is something that I started discussing with Zach. Um, we have seen uh, some kind of uh, very stress. Uh, um, stressful uh, days after uh, the CPI number, which uh, obviously they got gold to go up, Bitcoin went up, and then there was lots of volatility and kind of like panic. How are you feeling about uh, uh, the stock market now, Clem? I mean, we see Lois just cross 50, uh, 50 pounds, which is, uh, uh, yeah, which is kind of like... Uh, what did what? Uh, Lois. Lloyd's didn't cross 50 pounds, it's, it's pennies. Yeah, 50 pennies, sorry, sorry. Well, um, banks, look, banks are, are, are going to um, do well in inflation because everybody who's active runs around borrowing money and, you know, money moves faster. So it's going to be good for them. Interest rates are going to go up, maybe, uh, probably not. Um, but that will be good for them too. 
So you yes. still think that they are gonna gonna they are not gonna go up so soon. They are gonna go up later in the, in next year. They're all gonna go up. Everything's gonna go up. That's what inflation is. <laughs> inflation is stuff going up. Well, but they're I'm not sure. going up. Money's going down, and therefore the number on the price ticket goes up. Everything's going up because of that. Now, the question is how much. Now, the, um, many people say, oh, it's going to go hyperinflation. It's not going to go hyperinflation. We're going to get somewhere between 50 and 100% inflation in the next three to five years. So if something's 50p now, it's going to be a pound. Uh, so it's a pound okay. now, it's going to be two pounds. The value won't change. It's very, very simple. Look, you, if you lock up the world for however long they locked up the world, the world gets poorer. Now, nobody wants to see their balance go down. They, don't, they want to feel like they're not got any poorer and they've got debts and the government's got massive debts because they bailed everything out right so they've got to fill that hole the only way to fill that hole is to rebalance everything the only way to rebalance everything is to inflate away everything so that the flow of the change of numbers gets everything flat but everyone's going to have to be 10 or 15 percent poorer or certainly anybody that doesn't see it coming is going to be 10 or 15 percent poorer because the world is 10 or 15 percent poorer now some people are going to get 50 percent poorer and if you're really, really fast on your feet, you're going to get 20 or 30% richer. Yeah. But the world has got poorer because it sat there with its hands under its backside, waiting for the all clear as it had to. Well, it wasn't making stuff, was it? It wasn't digging holes. It wasn't manufacturing cars. It wasn't making wealth. And when you total up all the wealth, all the stuff that wasn't made, that's a lot of money. And that's a loss. And that loss has to be evened out. And the best way to do that is through inflation. And they can't not do it by inflation anyway, because they can't do austerity. I mean, how long are they going to last if they try that one on? They can't do it by doing cuts, can they? How long are they going to last if they try to do that one? They can't fire all the people in the, in the public sector now, can they? How that, how's that going to work? They're not going to cut their own pensions, are they? So the only way to do that is to have inflation. So they've already baked that into the system. They're going to have to keep doing it because they've got these budget deficits that mean that their deficits are only going to get larger. And the only way you can default on that is to inflate it. So inflation is baked in and the, the, the road of inflation is set. How long that takes to get the economies back to an 80 to 90 percent debt to GDP we don't know. I mean, there could be another COVID. We could all, they're locking them down in, in Austria, right? They're locking down people yeah. in Holland. If that repeats and repeats, I mean, that could be just forever thing. It could, it, it could get a lot worse. So there could be three or 400% inflation. But the stock market is going to keep going up to catch up with inflation, basically. Well, it's, it's got a tailwind with inflation. And certain things won't do so well. Well, and maybe, where do you can't find the liquidity because raising money is going to be an issue. Well, there's no shortage of liquidity. That's the whole point. The, the liquidity is coming out of our ears. The fact is people won't borrow it. They won't take the liquidity. Oh, give us that liquidity. We'll have that. They won't do that. They, they, they don't want to do that. They don't want to borrow the money. If you were going to the bank and say, give me 50 grand, they'll say, yeah, here it is, bang. Yeah, they're begging to be able to borrow money. Yeah. And at some point, people are going to go, there's inflation, big inflation, and I can borrow money at 3%. Or five percent, and there's a nine percent inflation. That means I'm getting paid to take the money. I think I've had some of that. That's what we do with, with mortgages, right? With houses, I'll borrow up to my gunnels to buy a property because I can, and then the property will go up, and my and my mortgage in real terms will go down. Oh, I'll have some of that. So that is the sort of environment we're going to be in. The question is, how much inflation are we going to get? To the governments get back to that natural balance of between eighty and ninety debt to GDP. And, you know, if it's, I think it's 50, between 50 and 100%, and it's between three to five years. So they're going to have that run. Now, some things will not keep up with inflation. Housing might not keep up with inflation. Certain stocks might not keep up with inflation. Some stocks will outperform. Commodities will obviously, well, would from histor history outperform inflation because everybody starts to panic. Yeah, so that goes up more. And then certain things might not go up. So, you know, if there was a bit of a recession, because there's a bit of a comeuppance and maybe the Bank of England started to panic about having 15% inflation or 12% rather than the five or six we're going to get. And they decided to put up interest rates and that did have a bad effect, although it probably won't because it's not about the interest rate. It's about the amount of money available to get your hands on. And they've got that one sussed, which is what's creating inflation.
Yeah, it's not the interest rate; it's the amount of money available to to be in the system that's causing inflation. So, if if they mucked up and caused a recession, then you know house prices could not go up as much as inflation, and then you'd have a real drop in value, which is a real thing because it's a real drop, not a numerical nominal drop. So, the, the future path is interesting, but it's definitely inflationary, and it's definitely for a reasonable period, it's definitely for the next two three years out, and of course. You know, I'm a politician. I'm a central banker. I'm going to generate inflation because I have to. Am I going to go, we're going to generate inflation because we have to? No, they're going to go, oh, no, oh, so worried about inflation, so worried. But it's not our fault. It's them over there. They did it. Oh, it's not as high as you think. No, it's down here, really. Oh, that. Oh, that's just there. That's a one-off. Oh, there's another one-off. Oh, there's another one-off. Oh, we, it's not us. We didn't do it. It's them. It's them. They did it. Oh, we're so worried. We're so worried. How many months have we got to go before we get that number back? Oh, we're going to have to do this for two years. Oh, we're so worried. We're so worried. In fact, I'm I'm leaving the job because I'm fed up with it and someone else will be making excuses for another 18 months. And bang, three years down the line, 85% debt to GDP or 90%. GDP's gone up so much, you know. GDP's gone up, yes. That's called inflation, mate. Oh, no, no, it's GDP. It is GDP. What are you talking about? No, no, we don't see it that way. Yeah. And look, our budget's back into line again and we didn't have to raise tax. Well, you did raise tax because all the thresholds stayed the same and inflation meant pushed everybody through them. Oh, well, we don't see it like that. It wasn't us. We didn't do it. Look over there. But when you get back to that 90 percent, all of a sudden, oh, they, they won't do any more of this liquidity and they will clamp down on it and I'll hold it there. And all of a sudden, interest rates will go up and liquidity will dry up if the economy can stand on its own two feet. They will go back to austerity, which will be minor to what? Would be necessary to get us back to that situation without inflation yeah and also we are seeing all the moving start to move uh, up as well well you know people are people get it right yeah. people get it now people know that there's inflation but remember this whole generation of investors most of them never seen inflation they've never lived in it you know they were born in in, in the mid 70s they didn't see any of it if they were born in the mid 60s you're an old Curmudgeon like me. That's a, that's I tell this story. Let me tell this story because I, you know, I like just to talk and talk. Yeah, so, true. This is what inflation does. When I was a kid, there was these things called matchbox toys. They were little cars in boxes, in matchboxes. And I could go for one pound and I could buy six. So I did. And then a few weeks later, they went up to 20p each. So I could buy five. And a few weeks later, they went up to 25p. So I could buy four. And a few weeks later, they went up to 33p, so I could buy three. Then they went to 50, and I stopped buying them because it wasn't much fun to buy two. And then they went to a pound, and now, heaven knows, they're probably five pounds now. So that's what inflation does. But I was born in the 60s, so I saw it. Everyone else is, most everyone else is 70s and 80s, and so they don't really get it, viscerally understand it in America and in Europe. They understand it, obviously, in, in Turkey and in all these other places but they don't understand it here. But the, they're starting to get the picture and therefore they're starting to move into gold. And gold is on, the, on its way now. So it'll be 1900 or more in a few weeks time. Okay, okay. And that's probably why the next, the, you know, the, 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 gen, the current generation is investing in Bitcoin as saying it's a safe haven asset, which... Uh, it's a safe haven asset, but it's not an inflation hedge. Oh, it's not an inflation hedge. And they think it is. I just wrote an article saying it's not an inflation hedge, guys. It's something that can double and halve and double and halve in one year is not a hedge against anything. I, I mean, Clem, I was listening at a coin desk. Uh, uh, daily roundup and uh, they were basically saying about being bitcoin being an edge against inflation and we just had our uh, chat last week we were actually explaining why bitcoin is not an edge against inflation and i thought that was uh, very interesting because at the end of the day people listen to podcasts they get the news they get they are basically thought by the media and when the media is saying something that don't make sense that's the problem then you have the wrong picture and you make uh, perhaps the wrong you make losses right because you know hedge is something that takes danger away from your life not adds it risk is great risk equals reward but the whole point of a hedge is you remove risk and you remove reward when you're hedged, you don't make or lose, right? So buying something that explodes and collapses is no hedge to anything. I mean, if you were totally, totally a quant and you could sit down with a spreadsheet with calculus in it, you could use Bitcoin 
as part of a very complicated diversified portfolio strategy to hedge against inflation. But that's not what people are talking about. They're talking about it's going to go up more than inflation. Yeah, that's that's, that's why people are taking loans from the bank to buy Bitcoin. That's what I've been, I've been well, hearing. That's not a hedge against inflation at all. Yeah. That's not a hedge. That's a one directional bet on a price move. Yeah. Now, if you bought um, something that if you if you took out a loan to buy, in fact, there's you, someone needs to do a crypto, which is a hedge against inflation, which you could do that. But, you know, to hedge against inflation, you need something that doesn't lose its intrinsic value. Well, unfortunately, Bitcoin doesn't have an old fashioned intrinsic value. So it, it's just it's not what the word hedge means. It's like if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Right. If it doesn't act like a hedge, it doesn't look like a hedge and it doesn't behave like a hedge. It ain't a hedge. Yeah. yeah. And Bitcoin don't look like a hedge, doesn't act like a hedge. It ain't no hedge. It's a wonderful thing, but a hedge it ain't. I don't know what it's a hedge against. I mean, I don't know what you would say it's counter correlated against, because that's what a hedge needs to be. When it, something goes up, it goes down. And when it goes down, the thing goes up. Or when it goes up, the other thing goes down. That's what a hedge is. Yeah. Yeah. You can't, you know, I mean, what would you buy Bitcoin? What goes up when Bitcoin goes down? What goes down when Bitcoin goes up? Well, I think everybody got a little bit confused last year when there was the crash and actually Bitcoin and gold went up together. So that's where maybe the narrative started to, to be built. Uh, yeah, but on that's the- because it's a haven asset. It's a haven asset. And gold is a haven asset. Okay, Bitcoin so is a better finish- haven asset, but a haven is not a hedge. Exactly. So to finish off, Clem, explain... This different because I think some people still get confused. Edge against inflation and even us, they think it's the same things, which is okay. I'm in Afghanistan. Okay. I'm the minister of stealing stuff. I'm the minister of something that has 300,000 policemen that get paid, but none of them exist because it all goes to me. Okay. So that's me about six months ago. Right. I'm in Afghanistan. The Afghani, whatever it is, shekel. There's a ton of, ton of, ton of inflation there. Okay. So I'm in, in dollars because I put all my money into Bitcoin, which is dollar denominated. So I've got a hedge in my currency because I'm actually holding it in dollars in a, in a sense. So that's my hedge, not Bitcoin, dollars, Bitcoin, dollars. OK, now that would be a kind of hedge. But then I've probably got 600 percent inflation in Afghanistan. So if you're holding anything is a hedge against inflation because inflation is just insane. It's even more insane than Bitcoin's price rises. Right. So it doesn't matter. As long as I get it out of the local um, currency, that's, I'm good with that. Now, the Taliban is on its way because America's fed up with people like me stealing all the money. All right. So I need it in a haven asset. Funny enough, Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a haven asset. Gold is a haven asset, but not when I want to get to the airport and fly out in a helicopter. Because my 500 million is quite a lot of gold. In fact, it's, I think it's about six tons. And the helicopter won't take that. But it'll take my um, my USB stick and I'll hang it for my ear as an earring. I'll say, this is the latest thing, you know. And in there is my private keys to a Bitcoin account with 8,000 Bitcoin in it. Because that's what I stole. So my haven asset in my little smart stick as I head for the helicopter, that's a haven asset. And it used to be gold. But in the old days, in places like Asia, they used to say, well, wealth is only what you can carry. If you can't carry it, it's not wealth. So get the picture. Well, you can't carry that much gold. Yeah. But you certainly can carry that much crypto. So crypto in that instance is a haven asset. In that instance, gold isn't a haven asset because I can't get it out. Right. So it's a better haven asset. Now, as a hedge against inflation, it's not so great because I bought it at 60,000 yesterday before I headed for the airport. And blooming things now 59. So that wasn't very good, was it? But anyway, better to leave the country with a thousand of those than it is to try to get a ton of gold out in my suitcase because A, it won't fit, and B, if it did, I couldn't carry it, right? So, you know, gold is a good haven asset if you really aren't running away from the Taliban. But Bitcoin is better. It's easier to move. It's easier to store. It's lighter. It's easier to secure. It doesn't cost 1% to hold it a year like gold does. But gold is still good as a haven asset. 
It's yeah. still somewhere where people go to, particularly if you're not rich and you want to have a haven of, say, if you, if you were an Afghan um, shopkeeper, you know, five ounces of gold is a lot of money to you. And that can go, you know, I don't know, you put it in your teeth. It, it, it's it's quite a good haven asset. And most of the world, at least 50% of the world, which is not on, online, that is the ultimate go-to haven asset. And it's a, a hedge against inflation traditionally because it won't halve and double over the eight weeks. So, so, so Claire, there is a bit of overlapping though between hedge against inflation and haven assets. If you have to consider um, an investor portfolio, what will be the allocation uh, to edge assets and and uh, and then edge against inflation assets and then even assets well, they so the way the portfolio strategy the classic portfolio strategy works is that you have bonds because bonds are meant to be safe and then you have equities and then you have a bit of gold two and a half percent five percent that sort of thing okay but people oh, don't oh. like bonds anymore i mean i i don't like bonds. people love bonds there's never been more bonds out there we don't like bonds because we, we we they're too boring. But the world is full of bonds. The bonds <laughs> is the senior market. Bonds dwarf equities. Okay, can we find a replacement for bonds for like an uh, a more like more like proactive or a new next generation investment portfolio? You mean, well, it's called equities. So you just go further inverted commas technically or theoretically or, or in in theoretically the um, investment book says bonds is less risky than equities. And therefore equities has a better return because it's more risky, more risk, more return. Yeah. And then you have a little bit of other things that are uncorrelated so that when equities crash, well, when equities crash, bonds go up, right? So there's your hedge. Yeah. And then you have a little bit of other crazy stuff, which add perhaps a little bit more risk, so a little bit more return, and hopefully do not go anywhere when equities go down or up or down. So when bonds go up, they don't move. And when equities go up, they don't move. They move under their own time. That's what a whole portfolio is about, so that you don't have a catastrophic failure. You don't have all your money in Lehman Brothers and lose the lot. Like or in 1929, when thousands, untold thousands of rich people got wiped out in the Wall Street crash. Yeah, that's portfolio theory portfolio management yeah so bonds because it's the ultimate liquid market i mean that's what the government rescued is bonds they mm -hmm. didn't go into equities well they do in, in japan but not not in america not in the uk it's the bond market it's a senior market that's how i saved my skin back in 2007 because a broker friend of mine said well you know bonds i said bonds are frozen you know what the, what's that all about and he said well bonds of course are the senior market and i went hold on a minute i'm ringing my broker sell everything yeah, because bonds had frozen, the senior market was dead. Well, the junior market is going to catch it in the back of the neck pretty soon after, isn't it? And and it did. Unfortunately, I was not under that piano when it fell out the window. But so, yeah, yes. But how do we get on bonds? Bonds. <laughs> exactly. Well, because we were thinking about uh, like a uh, uh, latest generation portfolio that doesn't have bonds. So what else would you put? Okay, we have got equity, right? Uh, so would you put maybe gold? Well, if you're watching this show, then you are pretty active. Bonds is for people that aren't. Exactly. So let's so, talk to the active people. Well, Should you know, you've got to be you've got to be a stock picker. You've got to yeah. you've got to be looking at that's, that's a good point. Crypto. That's yeah. equities and crypto. Okay. And you've got to go, well, you know, something I always tend to do is if 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 I get out of the market because I think it's gonna die. I get out of the market, you end up with a big bag of cash and you go, well, what am I going to do? Well, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to buy 30 stocks. Let's say six stocks. Okay, but 30 stocks. Well, 10 of them are going to be low risk. What I think is low risk, not what the market says is low risk. I'm going to buy 10 of them, which are medium risk. So, yeah, there's a little bit of bing there. And I'm going to buy 10 that are mad. Well, I think I'm mad, which is not what other people think is mad. I'm, I'm much more conservative than that. And then I'm going to go through them. And I'm going to make sure that there's, you know, they're not all in the same sector. They're spread all around. So I'm going to look at the, I'm going to look at a bank and I'm going to go mad, crazy bank, not mad, crazy bank, boring bank, one of each. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm going to go to engineers and do the same, do the same, do the same. So I'll have a spread of risk. Yeah. So I've got what I think is boring, what I think is not so boring, what I think is a bit woo. And that will spread my my risk over 30. You could do the same with, with crypto. Yeah. So you build up this 
um because you've got the time and effort and you're enjoying it and it's not work because you have fun you build up this portfolio a diversified portfolio of risk and, and then, then you have gold you really, and then you have a something. so i would go like well i i think there's inflation what's my brain tell me now well gold's going to do quite well i mean i was singing this months ago and the blooming thing keep going down you've probably heard me on the show going i don't get it what's going on well there's this big inertia lag in the market these days because it's so the price discovery has been so warped by central banks and um, protecting everything that the message doesn't get through from the brain of the dinosaur to its tail very fast these days which is a good thing but it's a bit disconcerting when it used to happen in a week rather than now it takes three months anyway so you go well inflation my idea is gold so what am i going to do i'm going to buy some gold well that's a pain in the neck well i'm going to buy some etf gold that's a pain in the neck Okay, and then I'm going to buy some miners. What miners are going to buy? I'm going to buy a boring miner, and I'm going to buy a not particularly boring miner, and I'm going to buy a really spicy yeah. miner. Yeah. yeah. So you go through. So you buy Newmont Mining. So, and then at the other end, you buy um, Sentiment. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and in you, crypto, you could buy Pax G Gold. Which well, is exactly. If you wanted to go that route, yeah. Or if, when you go to crypto, you go, well, I'm, I'm going to buy a chunk of of um, Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then I'm going to buy a, a chunk of Dash and, and Monero, and then I'm going to buy a, a chunk of crazy small one that no one's ever heard of. And then I'm going to go to the tokens and I'm going to buy, you know, the um, Uniswap and whatever the top ones are at the moment. And then I'm going to buy, you know, two in the middle. And then I'm going to buy two little minnows. And then I'm going to look at the, the, the blockchain wannabes. I'm going to buy some Avalanche. I'm going to buy some Matic. And I'm going to go down and buy some whatever it is that you've never heard of, but is still 300 million. And then I'm going to go down buy two or three crazy ones at, at 25 million and so on and so forth, right? So you've got that mix. And maybe you go, well, I'm, I'm really conservative. So I'm going to buy three units of, of the boring ones. I'm going to buy two units of the medium ones. I'm going to buy one unit of the crazy ones. Oh, now I'm getting more excited. I'm going to, I'm going to buy... You know, two, three units of the middle ones, two units of the boring ones, and two bo units of the crazy ones. And you can adjust depending yeah. on whether you've, you think, yay, it's all going great, or oh my God, oh my God, I'm worried now. So you adjust, you go risk on or risk off. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay, you have your um, set and, you, and, and you just crank the handle, and every day's another day, and, okay. and you make a lot of money. Okay, Clem, I think on that note, we are going to close this, uh, um, sh the show for this week, but I think there was a fantastic uh, um, uh, end of the, the, the webinar because I think uh, uh, reflecting on building the investment portfolio is a very important point, particularly when you are dragged away from something exciting coming up and then there is something else and then everybody's talking about inflation and gold. And I think, uh, you know, not... All investors, they are professional fund manager with 20 years experience in investing. I think some or most of uh, uh, retail investors uh, you know, that we see, they are the one that uh, need to do research. They need to have a direction. They need to stop and think about it. I need to make money with a plan, with a strategy, rather than just buy you know, on excitement. And it's important to have those conversations. I'd, I'd just like to leave with this, these two thoughts. When everybody wants to buy, you want to sell. And when everybody wants to sell, you want to buy. Yeah. And that way, you buy cheap and you sell expensive. And all you got to do is buy low and sell high. And everyone goes, oh, well, that's easier said than done. Well, that's true. It's not that easy. But when everybody wants to sell, not before everyone wants to sell, after everybody wants to sell, while everybody wants to sell, you want to buy. And when everybody wants to buy, and when everybody says it's going to go up, when everybody is already bought and no one else to buy, that's when you want to sell. Or maybe okay. just a little bit before that. Yeah. Because when everybody's bought, there ain't no one else to buy. And when everybody's sold, there ain't nobody else to sell. And that's when the market turns. Okay, Clem, thank you so much. And I will see you all next week. Thank you. Ciao. Bye-bye.